if you could find brand new worlds right here on Earth, where anything is possible? Same planet, different dimension. I found the gateway. The Rewatch Podcast presents The Sliders Rewatch, dedicated to the series Sliders on Fox and Sci-Fi Channel. Join us each week as we continue crossing the einstein rosen Podolsky Bridge and find ourselves in strange new worlds. Email your thoughts on each episode to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast or on Twitter at rewatch podcast. <laughs> And welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast and our Sliders Rewatch. I'm Corey. And I'm Tommy Joe Ray Bob the Kid. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for joining us again here at the Sliders Rewatch. Today we're discussing two more episodes of Sliders, The Good, The Bad, and The Wealthy, and As Time Goes By. All right, so the first episode today, The Good, The Bad, and The Wealthy, written by Scott Smith Miller, directed by Oscar L. Costo. This originally aired on March 22nd, 1996. Yeah! He's plastered. Wait a minute, wait a minute, let me help you. Oh man, what have you been drinking? Courage. I'm Wild Bill Hickok, and every two-bit gunslinger in the town wants a piece of me. You were in another gunfight? You've heard of corporate gunslingers? In this world, they're real gunslingers. Cuts the red tape of contracts, I guess. Help me get him to bed. First thing in the morning, we're out of here. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh. The sliders land in a world where the state of Texas has expanded westward to include a number of states, including the state we know as California. In this dimension, disputes are handled through gunfights and stock trading has become a literal poker game. Upon their arrival, Quinn comes to the aid of a man knocked to the ground during a poker game. Mistaken as a lawyer, he is forced to defend himself and ends up shooting the lead lawyer for this state's biggest law firm. Quinn is arrested, but before long, Billy Ray, a representative of that biggest law firm, comes to take Quinn to his boss, Jack Bullock, who offers him a job since he is obviously talented enough to outshoot his best gunslinger, to which Quinn says he will consider the offer. Meanwhile, Quinn is still affected greatly by shooting Bullock's lawyer until he is approached by Priscilla Hardaway and her son, Jamie, owner of a computer chip manufacturer, who tells him that she was the one who actually shot the man. Her motive was that the man had killed her husband on orders from Bullock, who is a corporate pirate who takes over companies and sells them for parts, and his next attack is her company. Her only hope is to earn enough money at the stock exchange slash poker game to get into a computer trade show and take her company public, gaining investors and then becoming safe from Bullock's takeover attempts. Remy steps in on the poker game when it's revealed that Priscilla's broker, Cliff, was murdered, framed to look like a suicide. Remy, quite the poker player, manages to earn a good deal of the money that Priscilla needs, but it's revealed that her plans need to change as Billy the Kid, the gunslinger she hired to help her defend against the takeover, has switched sides and is helping Bullock in a hostile takeover. Jamie, meanwhile, has stolen Quinn's gun and has gone to shoot Bullock himself since Quinn won't. Priscilla and Quinn go to stop Jamie and Quinn is mistaken as her chief counsel and is thus dragged into a showdown. At the fight, he removes his gun, refusing to shoot, to which his opponent refuses to fire on an unarmed man. Quinn tries to appeal to the townspeople, preaching peace over violence and pleads with the sheriff to arrest Bullock. The townspeople, including Priscilla, stand with Quinn against Bullock. This angers Bullock and he decides he will take matters into his own hands hands. However, the town sheriff informs him it is against the rules to do so. After Bullock tries to bully the sheriff down, the sheriff arrests Bullock for the murders of Priscilla's husband and her broker. The sliders slide out, and Jamie calls out, pleading for Quinn to come back. How you doing, Mr. Mallory? 
You give any thought to that proposition we made you? It is quite a lucrative offer. So how come words all over the street, you've climbed in bed with Priscilla Hardaway? I don't know what you're talking about. It's a preliminary SEC filing. Hardaway's company's in the midst of an underwriting. Seems she's taking the company public. Who's defending her? It's left undisclosed. You figure it out. What do you have to say for yourself, Mallory? For the way we took you and we made you a part of this family. I intend to prosecute you and Hardaway Computers with all due diligence. You understand me? I understand. And if any of you think you're faster than Dalton was, let's settle this right now. Thought so. All right, so getting into a little bit of trivia on this episode. Okay, so I found some stuff on a different site this week, uh, earthprime.net. And uh, on here, we have Billy the Kid was actually supposed to be a Bill Gates character or a lookalike for Bill Gates, which I think would have been, you know, that would have been pretty cool considering that uh, Priscilla Hardaway had a computer company. That would have been a nice little play into that. Mm, that's interesting. And for whatever reason, it just fell apart, it just didn't come together so they could do that, so they changed it. And Torme, uh, Tracy Torme, of course, admits that the show was a good idea, um, but it wasn't quite done right. It was very hard to actually translate the idea to an actual script on screen. Then we go back to Dimensions of Continuity, of course, for their Lost and Found section. And that's where we find out that uh, when Wade was talking about boys and their guns, uh, Arturo had a line about hearing more feminist claptrap from Wade, which I think, you know, I can imagine why they cut that because, you know, they don't want to offend the female watchers of Sliders, of course. So probably a good idea that they uh, they cut that line out. It was a little aggressive you know, on, on his part. There was an extra sheriff line or an extra part in the sheriff scene where it was revealed that the sheriff's deputy, I think was, was it Joe Bob, I think? <laughs> I think it was Joe Bob. I actually think it was Joe Bob. Yeah. Um, he was revealed to be an informant for Bullock. He goes on the phone. He says something about, I think, about Wade coming into the uh, office or something like that. So he was actually uh, working, you know, behind the scenes uh, against the uh, sheriff. There was a line about uh, how hanging is still a form of punishment for corporate espionage. In, there was a really uh, interesting scene. There, if you notice in this episode, there's not a lot of Wade and Arturo. And that's because these scenes got cut. There was a lot of arguing between them about violence and, you know, against violence. And, of course, you know, Wade was against violence. In the episode, Arturo was supposed to go and actually buy a gun. He was actually going to go to a store and purchase it. And there was a whole scene with that, which, uh, you know, of course, they went back and forth on as well. And you can read the whole thing. Uh, over at dimensionsofcontinuity.com if you're interested. Bullock's company was originally supposed to be called Texas Instruments, which, of course, you know, they make calculators back in the day. And I'm not sure if they're what they're doing today. Maybe they're still in the calculator business. Not sure. And then finally, someone, there was a line, a throwaway line, where someone was going to ask Quinn to handle his divorce, his divorce since he was such a good gunslinger. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine how that, how that works in that world, uh, getting divorced and being a gunslinger. I don't, no idea. <laughs> He's going to gun her down or something. Exactly. That ain't gonna save you, boy. You gonna shoot me in cold blood? Warm, cold, makes no difference to me. Go ahead. I'll be gone soon. Dead or gone. But there's something you people should know. I come from a world where men face the same dark challenges as you. The urge to compete, to kill for power and pleasure. You put that gun back on. Well, we weren't put on this earth to destroy each other. We don't have to live like this. Hey, tell me you were once a good man, Sheriff. When I'm gone, I hope you find your backbone again and arrest Jack Bullock 
for the murders of Cliff Sutter and Tom Hardaway. It's enough talk. Blast him! What are you waiting for? Tell I can't shoot an unarmed man. Mr. Buck, that's a violation of SEC regulations. Shut up. You're gonna have to kill me first, Mr. Bull. My way, Billy Ray. Save you the trouble, Mr. Bullock. I will pull the trigger. So getting into our discussion of this episode, right at the beginning, once again, we have someone saying the vortex. This time it's a child. Yes. Jane. Child. But, you know, he reacts. He reacts like, you know, you should react with awe and amazement. You know, he he thinks they're angels. So it, it fits. Yeah. And Quinn tries to just talk it away as in they're magicians. Yes. I love that Arturo starts putting on the Western accent. Yeah. It's such a bad Western <laughs> accent, too. Hey, partner. <laughs> Tell us where to get some grub. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> I knew it's supposed to be bad, but still, it's just, it, it made me laugh. So they, they wander into San Francisco, and they find that it is San Francisco, Texas. Yeah, so it's, and this was cool because they actually gave us a little bit of the old history with the different presidents and – you know, Sam Houston and all that. I thought that was that. I like that part. I like that part a lot. Yeah. The whole thing about the Confederacy mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, taking hold. They expanded up the coast and pretty much took over California. Exactly. Yeah. It was really good. Texas sprawls out over a, a larger area. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Pretty much the old West way of dealing with problems sort of got through into the legal system and the stock market mm -hmm. and everything. Right. So it was all played under old West rules of, you know, having duels, having gunfights, playing poker. And I think all this aesthetic is like really, really cool. I enjoyed seeing that part of it. And as long as you don't think about it too much, you know, it's like, this is a pretty cool episode. So the question I have is we've got lawyers and we've got stockbrokers and they're both apparently gunslingers in this world. You have the poker game going on in the beginning and you have jed playing against cliff cliff is uh priscilla hardaway's stockbroker basically but then you have jed who they say was bullock's chief counsel so he's a lawyer so we have a lawyer playing against a stockbroker in this poker game so i'm just wondering like are stockbrokers and lawyers interchangeable on this world because they're both playing on the stock exchange it just it seems that seems just weird to me. It's like confusing. Yeah, it's definitely confusing for me as well because I guess really you'd have to understand what it means to be a stockbroker and what it means to be a lawyer. And then on top of that, you'd have to understand the rules of the Old West. Right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. these are all things I don't really know too much about. I also don't really know much about poker. Right. So yeah, it all kind of just plays in together and it gets a bit confusing about what the actual rules and laws are. Yeah, because on our world, you know, stockbrokers and lawyers are two separate professions, completely different. You're not going to have a stockbroker going into a courtroom and you're not going to have a lawyer trading stocks on the stock exchange, you know? So it's a little confusing about how they, how they did that here in this episode. You know, they rock up at the saloon and it's all steak, <laughs> not much for the vegetarians. <laughs> and Quinn gets in on what just looks like a bar fight to him. Right. Yeah. As Quinn tends to do. He loves to just get involved. And he finds himself in a duel and he wins. He shoots a guy. You know, he's not too happy about that. No, he's pretty broken up. And I, I will say that I do think that Jerry O'Connell did an amazing job this episode of being like uh, really torn up about what happened. About You can see the emotions. Now. He's, he's not happy with what happened. This sort of leads him to Priscilla Hardaway, who I guess she owns a business that her husband had started, but her husband's now dead. So she's sort of struggling to keep it afloat. And she needs money, which I, which, you know, I took it to mean that she needs a million dollars to get into a trade show, which to me was odd because the computer trade shows that I know of, you wouldn't need a million dollars to get into the trade show. What did you think about that? Well, the way I kind of saw it was that she needed the million dollars to buy into the stock exchange or the poker game. Okay. And then she, you know, that's sort of where she can trade her stocks and then take her company public from there. 
uh, it, gotcha. you know, she would be in the trade show and she would now have a public company. So I think that's what Blick was getting at. Because okay, he he really wants Quinn to work for it, and which makes sense because if you know if I had a company and someone outshot you know my lead guy, I'd be like, all right, we need to hire that guy because he's he obviously he's the best, not this guy that I had. This guy's the best. Exactly, and that leads to this scene after Billy Ray has taken him out for target practice. They end up in Bullock's office, and he starts talking about how yeah his company does takeovers, but hostile takeovers are literally gunfights. Corporate gunslingers right. is, is the term they use. So Bullock starts to think that Quinn's actually working for Priscilla Hardaway. And he gets really flustered about the whole thing. Right. He says, he says, I'm going to prosecute Hardaway computers to the fullest extent of the law. And like when I saw that, I was like, well, wait, why? Why are you going to prosecute Hardaway computers? What have they done? They haven't done anything. They're just a company. You know, yeah, she wants to go public. And maybe, maybe she's hired Quinn, but you, he hasn't actually accepted a job with you either. So there's like, there's no crime going on here. So what do you mean you're going to prosecute them? I, I think Bullock was just mad. Yeah, I don't quite understand it myself because he doesn't really even ask Quinn if he's working for Priscilla Hardaway. He sort of just jumps to the conclusion and Quinn has no choice but to go along with it. Exactly. And he gets out of it by playing up that he's this amazing gunfighter. To which Bullock right, like, says, like, don't fight him. Right, exactly. And, like, it, it all stems from uh, what Priscilla Hardaway had told him, that, the you know, the myth is bigger than the man. So, like, you know, even though you can't actually shoot, everybody thinks that you are the best gunfighter ever. So just play that up. Because Bullock's got this guy, which he calls Billy the Kid. <laughs> you know, I guess could be a nickname, but it's just, it's very obvious what they're right. trying to do there. Billy the Kid. Well, yeah. Exactly. And that guy's, I, I don't quite see the purpose of him either. Like, he, I guess he's just there to protect Bullock. Well, I think that he's one of the best gunslingers, I guess, in this, uh, in this world. So I guess that's why they brought him in, because they need someone who's going to be, you know, better than Quinn. So they're like, all right, well, let's get this guy, because he's like, you know, the best gunslinger we've heard of. We, he's a gun for hire, basically. He's not, I guess he's not someone that, uh, that just, takes a normal everyday job he goes on it like a case-by-case -case basis like whatever you agree to pay him you know if it's within his price he's going to go ahead and join your team for that little amount of time for the takeover we get to the stock exchange which is a poker game and priscilla's called in a guy to come in and play for her but he hasn't shown up so remy is going to step in Priscilla says, just go in there and fold. And Remy goes into a backstory, which <laughs> I actually love seeing Remy do because he's always going on about, you know, back in the day when he was in Little Remy and the Shandells. Right. <laughs> and this time it's like, oh, we were on tour and they used to call me Crying Man Slim. <laughs> he's like exactly he's that good at poker. Yeah, we always we always get a lot of like Remy's like – because in the beginning, Remy is just sort of there, and he doesn't have much to his character except to be the comic relief. But as we go on, you know, they start inserting these little things from his past, you know, from his history. So he, he does become more and more fleshed out as we're going through the series, as we can see right now. But, uh, you know, as it stands, she's asked him to just go to the table and just keep folding. You know, she doesn't want to risk all the money. But Remy loses a big chunk of money right which i don't quite understand he says he's, he's almost sending the company broke he's lost so much money which i think was only like forty thousand dollars but still yeah still i think it's just like by folding you know he was able to avoid like the bigger bets because if you don't fold the you know the bets increase as you play poker i mean i don't play poker a lot i just play it on my iphone you know there's just some apps and they sort of take you by the hand very nicely and if i lose it's no big deal because it's not real money but I don't, you know, I know a little bit about it. As you play, the, you know, your bets are going to increase, you know. And so I think she was just thinking, you know, just fold because, you know, the the initial bet that you make, the ante that you make is is nothing. It's just a little bit here and there, really, in the grand scheme of things. So by folding, he was avoiding losing a lot more money is what I was thinking. But Priscilla's card player is dead, made to look right. like a suicide by Bullock. So Remy has no choice but to actually play, and immediately he's crying man slim. <laughs> he's crying man slim. <laughs> Burning up the cards. And I love that he just gets, like, so much money that, you know, when it's time to leave, he's just chuckling away, chuckling right up in their faces. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. It's a very funny reaction he has. Very good. Yeah, so he does really well. Which is in direct contrast 
to the bad actor of the episode, <laughs> your favorite actor of the episode. <laughs> I hate, Jamie, I hate child performances, especially when they're bad. <laughs> because I've seen so many good child performances. Well, yeah, exactly. There's a lot. There's good ones out there. You know, if actually we just watched uh, today uh, the original uh, was it Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and there's some good kid performances in that. And yeah, sorry, Jamie, you're not one of them. <laughs> no, you know, I always <laughs> go to like like Kirsten Dunst in Interview with a Vampire, right? right. Or uh, like Stand by Me. Mm. Really good child performances. This kid, who is supposed to have grown up in Texas, right. albeit San Francisco, Texas, clearly sounds Canadian. Right. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, they shoot sci-fi TV in Canada. And he clearly, at one point, when he's talking to Wade on the steps, uh, when Wade first starts talking to uh, Priscilla, he clearly says a boot instead of a bout. <laughs> It's so obvious. He just, I don't know, it, his character kind of confused me just a little bit because there, there was a part where uh, his mother was pulling him away from the sliders. I forget which ones, but he has a line as she's, as she's pulling him away, and he says, but they're lying. They saw him. You know, they're lying. They saw them or something. like He says something like that, and I'm like, what's he talking about? Who did the sliders see? Yeah, they're lying about not coming through the vortex or whatever, but, like, what did he mean by saying they saw him? I'm like, they didn't see anything. He almost immediately puts Quinn on a pedestal. And right. he's oh, calling yeah. him an angel and all kinds of stuff. Like, mm -hmm. God, he just gets so annoying. And then later, <laughs> you know, he steals Quinn's gun and goes and confronts Bullock. And at no point did I think he was going to shoot Bullock. No, definitely not. It's like a typical thing when the kid takes the gun, his hands are shaking. You, you know it's not going to happen. Now, speaking of Bullock, why he wants to shoot him, Priscilla Hardaway says that he killed her husband. They believe that he uh, killed Cliff, the, the stockbroker, by making it look like he hanged himself. It was actually a murder. But there's no, there's no proof of that at all given in the episode. We have, like, no confessions from anybody. We have no um, documents like photographs or videotape or anything that says, yeah, he actually, beyond doubt, killed these people. We have no idea. So I'm just I'm just wondering how this whole thing at the end when the sheriff says he's going to arrest him for those crimes. How? Why? There's no proof. How can you do that? The only thing I could think of was maybe like bribery of the sheriff or something like that. Because on the surface, it seems that Bullock is just following the law to the extent of the law. You know, he, he's got a exactly. bunch of gunslingers who work for him. Yeah, they've killed people, but that's how that's issues the, are resolved yeah. in this world. That's how this world works, you know, like that you people get killed. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm just like, I don't know. It's like because, I mean, the sheriff said specifically it's for this murder and this murder. And I'm like, man, I hope you have proof of this. Otherwise, these are lawyers. You know, <laughs> they're going to they're going to be all over you if, if you don't have proof of this. And you're the next one going to end up dead. And then it gets to this whole thing about how Quinn is going to have a gunfight with Billy the Kid. But he puts his guns down and just gives a big inspirational speech about how things are done in this world. And it really makes me think, like, is this really going to change anything? Because it's not. It's not. No. Definitely not. Can you imagine, like, if suddenly in our world they just up and changed how the stock market works? Mm -hmm. That's not going to bode well with anybody who works in the stock exchange. I mean, it's a good idea. I mean, it's a nice idea when, you know. The hero comes in, you know, this charming guy and changes, you know, life around him, makes people realize that this is wrong and they should choose another way. But like in this world, they've been living this world for a long time. This is ingrained in their very being. So, I, you know, one speech by a guy who's there for, you know, a week and then leaves, I, not going to change anything. And of course, gun wars are like a really hot topic like right now. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. especially in the States. So we're seeing firsthand how difficult it is to get people to put their guns down. Yeah, And that's just in a world where people feel they have the right to have a gun, which right, is exactly. their constitutional right to have a gun, mm -hmm. let alone in a world where Texas is this huge area of the United States and guns are used in legal negotiations and <laughs> things yeah, like that. It's, and it's, yeah, it's a more powerful state in, in this dimension. Yeah. So it's not going to happen. No, nope. it's just not. <laughs> like I said, it's a nice idea that, yes, after they leave, everyone switches around completely 180. But no, nah, no. <laughs> this is one world that if the sliders came back to, they'd be like, 
well, this looks exactly the same. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> changed. Like, well, that's how it works, kids. You know. Yeah. We also have just a note at the end of this episode. We have a tribute to the movie uh, Shane, which I have not seen. Um, so I'm just taking people's um, opinions, you know, for what they say about it. When Jamie is calling out to Quinn at the end, he's like, Quinn, come back, Quinn. You know, apparently that's in the movie Shane. But in the movie, Shane dies. So it makes a little more sense because, you know, when someone dies, you're like, you don't want them to leave. You feel this, you know, emptiness. You're like, come back, come back. But in this one, Jamie knows Quinn is alive. He's just gone. He's going. He's leaving. Well, I've seen Shane and I can see that. Because there is a kid in the movie Shane who sort of idolizes the character of Shane. Mm. And he just spends the whole movie voicing his opinion on how good Shane is. Right. Oh, Shane. Oh, you're going to help us, Shane. <laughs> and I, I was annoyed at that kid, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this, yeah. And even Tracy Torme said, you know, that uh, the, the tribute to Shane that he did was not in the original scripts. It wasn't something that they were going to do. It's something that he added in like at the last minute, you know, and it was done very ham handedly, I guess would be the, the term. Like they, they, they like sort of forced it in and it just didn't, it didn't flow well with everything else. But, you know, overall, I like the aesthetic, uh, mm -hmm. the old history is all very interesting. Even if it does get all, you know, confusing with all the, the legal yeah. stock market stuff, I still really enjoyed the episode. Yeah. I didn't think about it much when I first saw it. When I first watched it, I was like, yeah, this is fun. This is a neat way to, you know, how you know how this dimension came about and how they handled you know problems with the gunfights and everything that's a neat idea but it's only now looking at it with a more critical eye i'm like well this kind of falls apart a little bit here and there and this doesn't make sense you know but yeah it's not a bad episode really i mean i didn't hate it like uh time and again and world and whatever that title was you know it was this was not a terrible episode <laughs> And now it's time for another episode of Tech Talk with Quinn Mallory. We're a troop of magicians practicing our act. So how about it? Think you can keep a secret? This has been another episode of Tech Talk with Quinn Mallory. All right, getting into our second episode today. It is As Time Goes By, written by Steve Brown, directed by Richard Compton. This originally aired July 12th, 1996, and was actually the season two finale. It's interesting that in the jumble, it should have been so early in season two rather than the mm -hmm. actual end of season two. This is too bizarre. You, you really expect me to believe that you're from another planet. Not another planet, exactly. I come from a parallel Earth where time is the same, but the outcome of many events were different. And in this other world, um, Spain lost the new world to the Anglos? Yeah. And all the people speak English? California is part of the United States, the most powerful country in the world. I, I'm not expecting you to understand it, but everything I'm telling you is the truth. The point is, if we can save my friends, I can take you there. I can't believe I'm buying this. What about Dennis? Well, what about him? Well, he's being deported to Canada. I, I can't just leave him here. He's everything in the world to me. You help me. We'll see if we can save him, too. We start the episode with our group looking for work on a street corner as we learn that this is the country of New Spain, a major world power where Mexicans are the majority and very prosperous, where people from other countries, most notably Canada, try to immigrate here to find work and a better life. After a shakedown by the Mexican Immigration Department, Quinn gets away, jumping over a wall to escape the officers, only to be faced by two angry guard dogs. He is saved by the maid on duty, who he recognizes as a girl from his childhood named Dalen. 
When he awakens, he explains sliding and how in his world, Spain lost the new world to the Anglos. He says he can take her with him, but when she balks at leaving her fiancé, Dennis, behind, Quinn agrees to help him, too. They formulate a rescue plan with Dalen's brother, which almost goes off without a hitch, until it's revealed that Dennis made a backdoor deal to turn the immigrants in in exchange for a green card and legal status. Dalen's brother is shot during the botched escape, and Quinn and company are forced to slide without them. On the next world, Remy convinces Quinn to give it another try and find Dalen on this world. It's here that Dalen is a mother and is stuck in an abusive relationship with Dennis, who has quit medical school to become a musician. Quinn explains sliding to her, but says they couldn't take the baby. He comes up with an alternate plan involving Dalen going to Seattle to meet Quinn's double, who apparently feels the same way as our Quinn does about Dalen. Our sliders slide out once again. During the final slide of this episode, the Vortex has a shift and moves backwards, and Remy, the Professor, and Quinn find themselves at the end of the slide standing in prison, with Wade nowhere to be seen and a timer that is counting up rather than down. A lawyer comes in and explains that their appeal was denied by the Supreme Court. Next, a guard comes in and handcuffs them to take them to their arraignment, a process that is supposed to happen before they go to prison. During the arraignment, Quinn notices the inverted clock and its movement and surmises that in this dimension, time moves backwards. Soon enough, with time moving backward, they find themselves before the arraignment free. They discover that Quinn was arrested for his part in murdering Dalen, who is an undercover cop in this dimension. He decides to stop that murder since they are moving backwards in time and will have the chance to do so. After another few skips backwards, Quinn finds himself at the scene of the crime and shouts out a warning to Dalen, causing her to be shot in the shoulder rather than a fatal shot as it had happened originally. This change then causes a rip in the space-time continuum, and as this world comes to its inevitable end, the sliders slide out, and in the next world, Quinn decides to not continue on his quest to connect with Dalen. Look at you. <laughs> How did you ever find me? Only one Dalen Richards listed. I figured it had to be you. <laughs> so, when did you move back? To San Francisco, I, I, I mean. I've been here the whole time. It was you that moved away. What was it? <laughs> Tenth grade. You told me that you were going to Seattle because your dad got a job in aerospace. Thought about you a lot, Gwen. It broke my heart when you moved away. Me too. I, I guess that's why I'm here. I've, I've always had this fantasy about coming back for you. Going off on an amazing adventure together. kind of hard to explain all right so how about we get into a bit of trivia on this episode originally quinn was supposed to have been bitten on the leg by one of the guard dogs and that's why in the episode he has a bandage on one of his uh one of his legs uh and it's also explained when remy and quinn go to the bar and start talking about dalen and uh, remy's uh past story also about a woman uh, Quinn says he's always felt a need to help Destiny, like, or help Dalen. It's like his destiny to help her, to save her. And he's always felt a pull uh, towards her. And that's when Remy suggests, well, you know what? You should look her up then, see if she's on this world. The scene where uh, Quinn goes to the um, grungy Dalen uh, with the, uh, in the abuse of a relationship, it happened pretty much the same way, except uh, instead of some of the lines that they were giving back and forth to each other, they uh, had the baby included in that scene as well. And they were passing the baby back and forth. And it's probably a good thing they, they cut that out because you never know with babies, you know, <laughs> yeah. when you're doing the scene, like they're going to cry, you know, they're going to go to sleep on you or whatever. You have no idea. So, you know, for production purposes, probably a good idea they, they cut that out because otherwise the scene is exactly the same. You just got to see, you know, Jerry O'Connell holding the cute baby and all the ladies could be like oh he's so cute Look at, you know that type of thing he's such a good guy that jerry oh my god so anyway you were supposed to see gomez calhoun from the uh, motel 12 slash dominion hotel he was going to be in the street pointing to 
the sliders running away when they were um, almost going to get caught by the cops in the one scene. Uh, no, no lines were given to him. He was just going to appear as a, you know, just standing there pointing to where he saw them. And then the ending was really different than the, uh, the final one that we saw. There wasn't going to be a rip in the sky. There wasn't going to be weird planets moving around. The original ending felt a lot less like an ending of a world. There was going to be this blue rain that started to fall, like some kind of like strong blue rain, but it wouldn't get their clothes wet. It was just like a weird substance. Like they touched it and said, this doesn't even feel like water. You know, it's just, it's weird. And it just fell on them and it didn't get them wet. And that was like, you know, then Arturo says his line about ripping the space time continuum. And that was, they just slide out. It, it felt a lot less epic than it did in the final episode. Yeah, that would be a bit confusing. It just seems odd. Like it just starts raining this blue liquid. Like where did this come from? (laughs) What the hell? (laughs) Yes, the physicist Stephen Hawking pointed out there's no theoretical reason why time's arrow should point forward. It could just as readily point backwards. We have obviously landed in a universe where Hawking's theorem is proven true. But we're living forward. Yes, as far as we are concerned. As far as the people in this world are concerned, they're living forward too. Uh, But their forward happens to be the reverse of ours. Hence the clocks. Which would account for why things keep jumping. Like the skipping record. Of course things be discontinuous. They'd have to be. (laughs) I can't wait for you to tell Hawking that his theory was correct. He'll be so delighted. All right. So getting into our discussion of this episode. So just like the episode we just watched, we have an alternate... I guess, territory of San Francisco. This time it's mm-hmm. the República de Nueva España, which translates to the Republic of New Spain. So, you know, I really like this sort of old history where it's like really, really different. And I'm glad that they're given a little bit of that old history because that's that's the part that I like the best. That's That's the neat thing about all these other alternate dimensions where something, just one little tiny thing changes and the whole world is affected by that. You know, I like that stuff. So this, this was, I like that they put that in there. The first time I started watching this episode, it made me think like, oh, I did Mexico take over the United States. But no, they go the step further because, you know, the Anglos discovered America. It was the Spaniards who discovered South America. Right. So in this world, the Spaniards kind of just discovered everything except for Canada. There was no... United States of America in this uh, in this land. It was just always, it just became New Spain. Yeah, so I find that really interesting as well. And this whole idea of class reversal in that the Canadians want to immigrate to New Spain because it's just better conditions there. Mm-hmm. So I guess Canada has sort of become the Mexico yeah, in a way. Basically, <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. If you really pay attention to the episode, the, the writers took a lot of digs at Canada in this in this. Uh, episode and you know because the show's filmed in canada and a lot of people like i've i heard someone say that they didn't take a job on sliders because it was shot in canada i think it was there, there was there was someone else who's going to play the professor originally i forget is a very famous actor too but he said once i found out i was going to shoot in vancouver i was like no nah, i don't want to do that you know something <laughs> just bad bad so he didn't want to do it and it was it was someone who was talking about like on a like late night talk show. So it was someone pretty big. But yeah, so they take quite a few digs at Canada, especially Remy. He's like, you know, it's cold, and it's wet, and my records didn't sell spit up there. You know? <laughs> it's like, all right, well, you know. Uh, and then if you watch the episode with uh, the captions on, there was a closed caption that they didn't actually say, like no one actually said it, but the caption said, go back, you know, to Canada, you dirty uh, fur back. You know, it was like a derogatory insult term. So yeah, they, they, they really gave it hard to Canada in this episode, which is, you know, which is funny because today, the, the day we're recording this, at least here in the States, I, I saw earlier, it's National Canada Day or something. Oh, so, okay. so, you know, it fits in, it fits in with our, our podcast. Let's there. celebrate by being derog- <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly <laughs> derogatory towards Canadians. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I like the, the aesthetic of it all. It's sort of like how, you know, even though it's an old history, things tend to play out the same Mm -hmm. way in that, you know, yes, the U.S. has a large problem with illegal Mexican immigrants crossing the Mm -hmm. border and taking jobs. And here in this world, it's kind of the same thing as they have all these immigration officers chasing these Canadians and screaming things like, get out of my country. How dare you come to my country? Exactly. (laughs) So, yeah, so it's like it's a sense of patriotism towards your country, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and not enjoying the fact that illegal immigrants are taking over. You know, I'm not saying immigration, right? 
there's a bad thing. Immigration is always good, but you got to do it legally. Right. You can't just infiltrate someone else's country and start taking jobs right. wherever you want. So, exactly. Yeah, so it's cool how, you know, it sort of plays out the same way. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, was, you know, because they have to run away from immigration. Quinn gets away, and he takes a hit to the head. And when he wakes up, there's Dale, mm-hmm. you know, the girl that got away, as it were. And I understand he took a hit to the head, but he immediately starts talking to her like he knows. Yeah. <laughs> and giving her all the history that they had together. Right. And I'm just thinking, you know for a fact this isn't Dalen <laughs> that you know. And she, she obviously doesn't know him. So yeah, it just struck me as weird that he would start talking to her like that. Yeah, he's acting, he's acting quite like Sid from El Sid. You know, like he's talking to her like she's, you know, someone that he actually knew. But you know, they, well, they get into a conversation and he just tells her everything. Oh yeah. And it makes sense though. It makes sense that they wouldn't know each other at all in this world because there was never a United States of America. So they never grew up together in San Francisco like they did in the United States of America. So it makes sense that they never crossed paths in this world. In a world where the Spaniards did discover America, mm-hmm. you're going to change who people are, you know, which people meet and have children and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So Quinn might not even exist in this world. You know, Quinn may not exist in this world, but I'll tell you who does exist. His real life brother, Charlie O'Connell. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he exists in this world. He's not playing Colin Mallory, but he's there. Yeah, so he shows up as Dalen's brother, Caleb. Yes. Which I thought was an interesting thing. I'd forgotten he showed up this early, albeit not playing Colin Mallory, he's playing Caleb. But yeah, interesting to see him. I didn't know who he was like when I first saw this episode. But when later on, as I had gotten through, you know, season three and four and whatnot, when I went back and rewatched it, I was like, oh, my God, that's Colin. But no, it's not Colin playing a different character. So they've got this plan and they're going to go and rescue all the people who are being deported back to Canada. And it doesn't go so well. No, it it's such an easy takeover of the prison in, the prison van though. Like it's it's so easy. Like they just pull up in this big truck and all the guards on the uh, the van get out with their guns, but like they are overtaken so easily, you know, by by our guys. It's like, come on, you didn't know this was coming. I mean, you de- you haven't watched TV or movies at all. Although you know what, it is the Republic of New Spain, so maybe they don't have the same type of movies. Yeah, but it doesn't go well because more immigration guys show up anyway. Right, and Caleb gets shot, mm-hmm. so Dalen can't go with them, which irks me because going over the last couple of episodes, they've been talking about how they shouldn't take more people. <laughs> right, exactly, and they keep doing it. Yeah, but it turns out that Dennis is a total douchebag. He sold yes. everybody out because he was going to get a green. But instead, it got, quite possibly, got Dalen's brother killed. This is interesting because I think this is the first time that we're going to see a story play out over several different worlds. Usually, it's just like, yeah, we find an alternate world, play out the story, and then we leave. Yeah, and I loved it. I love that they did more than just one, you know, one world in the episode. That was really cool. So we end up in a new world, and Rami talks Gwen into looking up Dalen. And it's like she's almost his his Dalen, but not really. Right. She's like the uh, reverse Dalen. Well, yeah. uh, we, don't, we don't want to say reverse Dalen because that's coming up. Yeah, exactly. I was going <laughs> to, was, when I was typing out the notes, I was like, oh, I'll call her just reverse Dalen. But then that might get confused with the next world. But yeah. In this world, it was Quinn and his family who moved away rather than in Quinn's world where Dalen and her family had moved away. Right. And they almost have a touching moment. But then Dennis shows up and he's still a douchebag and Dalen has a baby. So, you know, it's not going to work. I did like the way that uh, Quinn came up with a solution for this uh, for this problem, though, because he he sets her up with his double. Which I thought, well, there you go. That's the way to do it. That's a good solution. Well, at the same time, he's dropping a burnt out woman and a baby on him. <laughs> this is true, but like you know, like like they said, you know, Quinn of this world, he he liked uh, Dalen as much as you know our Quinn liked Dalen. So I, I you know what he. He might be okay with that, you know, because there's, you know, sometimes you just meet someone that you just feel that connection with, you know, and like you will take on whatever just to be with them. You know, this gets resolved pretty quickly. They're not here for very long and they slide into another world, which is an interesting concept. I'm not sure it plays well. What do you reckon? Well, I, when I first saw it, I was like, this is cool. This is neat. I love this episode, you know, Uh, but when you start looking at it, you know, with a very critical eye, you know, or even a slightly critical 
guy. It doesn't quite all work. So it's like, I don't think... You don't go to sliders for hard science. I know they do a lot of that in X-Files where they explain the actual signs of things. They don't do that in sliders. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. And if you do that in sliders, everything falls apart. It's, just, it's not as much fun. So you just got to sort of suspend your disbelief and take it you know, as good, just fun entertainment. And it's a lot more enjoyable that way. In the pilot episode, Arturo explained that time is always going to remain the same and mm-hmm. that it's going to remain continuous. So the... The amount of time they spend in another world is the same amount of time that's passing in their own world. The concept here is that it's a theory that Stephen Hawking had, was that for us, time is moving forward, but time's arrow could easily just point in the opposite direction, which is what's going on here. Forward for them is our backwards. So they get into this whole thing about time shifts, how... So it it almost seems that like an area of time plays out, but then they shift backwards to what happened earlier. and that's when it gets confusing because when they're at the arraignment and they plead guilty, immediately they come over and take the handcuffs off. And I'm thinking like, that's not exactly how it would have played in concurrent time. Like he wouldn't have come over and removed the handcuffs. Mm -hmm. They would just have a time shift and suddenly they would not be in the arraignment anymore. They'd just be free. So it does get a bit messy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very confusing. That's why I say you just sort of suspend your disbelief and it's like, okay, this is fun. But then when you start thinking about it, it's like, yeah, it doesn't really work because I mean, they, you know, in this world, if time had moved forward, you know, they would have slid, like if time was moving forward, they would have been sliding from their jail cell without Wade because she wasn't there in the, in that final scene. That would have been the end. It's like, So they slide without weight or they wait and they're stuck there. Like, what's the deal there? And it makes me think whether or not just them being there is what causes the rift in space time. Right. Because it's, yeah, it's it's sort of, you know, we're led to believe that it's because Quinn saved Dalen, which is, I guess, a big thing. She was supposed to die. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they weren't supposed to slide off the planet at all because they wouldn't have the timer either. They were in prison. Yeah, why would they have the timer in prison? That's not, I'm pretty sure that's not allowed. You're not allowed yeah. to have uh, advanced technology if you're going to be in jail, I don't think. They also say that the timer was counting upwards. Mm-hmm. But when they go to slide, it counts down and then opens. So Yeah, that was weird too. That's right. I remember that. So yeah, so I'm not too sure they pull off what they're trying to achieve here. It was a neat idea. I really liked the idea of it. It was difficult to understand, I guess. Uh, there was a, I saw a quote again from Tracy Torme. I think it was on the um, Earth Prime site. And he had said something about there was one writer, well, it was the writer of this episode, uh, Steve Brown, who really understood, like he really understood uh, Hawking's theory about uh, reverse the reversal of time or time moving backwards. And he really uh, championed this story. And they said, Okay, you take this, <laughs> you know, you do this, you write this. So he really understood it, but I just, I don't think it, in, in this format, maybe, you know what, maybe if they had done it over a full episode, they could have, you know, maybe uh, explained a little bit more, made it a little bit clearer. The other thing I was thinking about, which this goes back to our first, our first episode, um, where we were talking about the deleted scenes from the pilot, they had a character in there, and I mentioned this back then, her name was Stephanie, and it was supposed to be a recurring character, that would show up throughout the pilot in, on the different worlds that they went to. And it was, a, it was a, a girl that Quinn really had a big crush on. And I think I had said back then that it would have been neat if they had cast Dalen, you know, as this character and had her show up throughout the whole series. And then when you get to this point, you know, it's like, oh, he, this is the girl that he's been seeing over and over again. He's actually going to go try and make a move now. You know, I think that, that would have made the scenes with her just a little bit bigger, like more impactful, I think. Like you would have felt more... I don't know, more emotion about him finally deciding that's it. But if they had done that, we probably wouldn't have had Quaid and all those other wonderful moments. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but, uh, you know, at the same time, they've caused this rift in space time. And Quinn seems pretty nonchalant about the whole thing. <laughs> he's like, like oh. he's just looking up at it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He's, wow. That's the way he's like, he's like, wow. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, look what I did. <laughs> it's like, look, mom, destroyed the whole world with no hands. Yeah, no real repercussions or emotion yeah. about what they've done. They've destroyed a world. But I'll tell you, this episode, this was a better episode than the last time they encountered 
the same people across multiple worlds, which was the time and again and world and again and time, whatever the title that was. Yeah, this was I, I, I felt this was much more enjoyable than that episode for me. Yeah, it was still interesting. It was mm-hmm. still a good episode, but yeah, it fell apart in the logic there at the end. Yeah. Well, I guess that does it, huh? Three worlds, three strikeouts. But if you can look at it this way, I mean, at least you saved a life. That's got to be something, huh? I mean, besides, I mean, the way your comma was headed. If you two ever did get together, you'd probably have a child that would destroy the world. There's no need to invoke a destructive child. Mr. Mallory has done it all by himself. Have you looked at the heavens? Oh, my God. There's a hole in the sky. Hey, what's going on? You've changed the future. You've ripped a hole in the fabric of time. God knows what the consequences will be. What could it mean? In layman's terms, I fear tomorrow may no longer exist. Wow. Well, we can look at it this way. I mean, I mean, maybe it's all for the best. But then again, maybe not. So, shall we get into some messages in time? All righty. So, we'll start off with as time goes by. And uh, the first thing that I had found was actually I did my own research instead of going back to the forums because I wanted to look up that Time's Arrow that they were talking about. And actually, Time's Arrow was the name of a novel came out, I think it was in 1991. And I know that uh, that Arturo was talking about the uh, actual theory, you know, with Time's Arrow, but the the novel itself by Martin Amos was a novel that was told in reverse chronology. So if you're into the, you know, the reverse time and thing like that, this this book, this novel starts at the end and there's a narrator that narrates it. You're not sure who the narrator is, but it's a very it's just like this episode where it goes backwards in time and it it says it gets very confusing, you know, but it's a, apparently it's a pretty neat book. So if you're if you're into that, check out Time's Arrow. And there's two other novels or two other stories out there. There's one by Philip K. Dick, famous sci-fi uh, author called Counter Clock World. And uh, there's another one by Brian Aldiss called Cryptozoic. And so both of those are apparently stories about uh, worlds where the time goes in reverse. So if you like the idea, check those out. The uh, Like I said, Time's Arrow I found on my own, but Philip K. Dick and the Brian Aldiss story were mentioned on the uh, forums that we uh, we look at, the 1996 forums. Also from those old forums, someone was saying, you know, this world is moving backwards to us, but for that world, it's forward. So they were trying to explain, like, we're getting confused, but they were getting confused back then as well. You know, like they were talking about what, these skips that they, they keep doing, you know, the sliders experience the skips, but no one else's experience the skips, or does everyone experience the skips? Like they had no idea, you know, what was going on. Um, they said, shouldn't people be moving backwards and talking backwards if they're moving? You know, it was a confusing episode for a lot of people, and they, a lot of them did not like this episode at all. Like they, they were fine with it up until that last world. They were like, oh, what, what's going on here? They had no idea. They said it was confusing. They kept saying, well, this is just breaking the laws of physics. This would never happen. This couldn't possibly be. So there was a lot of argument, a lot of, a lot of dislike for that part of the episode. Like I said earlier, the clock wasn't moving backward. It was inverted um, because people were saying, how come the clock was moving backward? The clock was moving backward and the people weren't moving backward. Again, just very confusing for the average person. And actually, these people aren't even average people because if these people are on the internet in 95, 96, they're like the forerunners. You know what I mean? They're like 
they're into this stuff. So they should be understanding, but they didn't. They said the abuse scene with Dalen and, and Dennis was really well done. It was very tragic. They wanted a different ending. Uh, again, not with the uh, the time thing, with the reverse time, but with Quinn trying for Dalen again and failing at it and then finally realizing it's just not meant to be. You know, it's just that's not who he's destined to be with. They would have preferred an ending like that. Um, there was some good uh, comments about Arturo when he told that uh, tale about the appointment at Samara. And I, I agree. He did a really nice job of telling that story. Um, it was creepy, but it was really good. So there's a lot of compliments to him for that. And this show originally aired after the season finale. The season finale was supposed to be Invasion, but they didn't like uh, this this episode as time goes by. So they put it at the very end. Yeah, I find it very odd that they would choose this episode of all episodes right. to well, be to the, the season finale. Yeah, to them, I'm thinking maybe they just thought, this thing is too confusing. We don't even want to show it, but all right, we'll just we'll put it on after the, the season finale. Maybe people won't even watch it. You know? <laughs> I don't know. So if we go now let's go back to Good, Bad, and the Wealthy. Uh, again, from the forums, people were saying, you know what? This is kind of an unbelievable premise because the Old West really wasn't like that. If there were gunfights every day, eventually there'd be no more gunfighters. You know, they would just kill each other off. There wouldn't be anymore. So good point there. You know, very good point. They said the stock market replaced by a poker game, that basically puts your company, your your money, your capital in a game of chance. And they don't think people would do that because industries would just fall left and right because it all depends on how the cards come up. You know, at least with the stock exchange, you got some idea of whether it's going to go up or down. You can sort of predict that type of thing if you're good at it. Um, but in this case, it's just luck of the draw. They said there's not really enough character development from anyone in this episode, and they're kind of right. I mean, I could see Quinn a little bit, Remy definitely, but Wade and Arturo are basically non-existent in this episode. They said this episode, Good, Bad, and Wealthy, they looked at the ratings, and this one, this episode finished 86 out of 110, whereas a repeat of the X-Files that same week did 59. So a repeat of the X-Files did better than a brand new episode of Sliders, which was not, that's not very good at all. No, um, that's not good. <laughs> no. Also, they mentioned Space Above and Beyond was 93. So, okay, that did worse. So there we go. But 90210 was 41. So, <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, this is our world. Anyway. Well, 90210 would have been hitting the target demographic. Right. This is true. This is true. As opposed to Cypher. Um, someone had uh, said again, you know, as I've said many times, that they they did not like the Shane references. They did not like the Wizard of Oz episode. They did not like the Ghost episode, the Jillian of the Spirits episode, and they really didn't like uh, like this one either. They're, they're not a fan. They're not a fan about it. Um, they said it was too preachy about gun control. Their least favorite episode. Someone said, uh, you know, it's funny. They're saying it's too preachy about gun control. Imagine if they had kept in the scene with Arturo and Wade arguing. You know, about guns. I mean, oh, yeah. heads would have exploded. And then finally, we have the greatest idea that I, I wish they had thought of doing this. You know, that we have the karaoke country singer. It would have been excellent. And this person, it was his idea, said Remy's double should have been the karaoke singer. <laughs> because Remy says, I, I hate that caterwauling, you know, or whatever he said. It would have been great to have seen his double up there singing country. <laughs> Would have been awesome. It would have been great. Yeah, especially if he was like really bad at it. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, imagine the comments that Remy would have. <laughs> All right. Well, we have some messages from Earth Prime, which we got from the sliders.tv forum. Yeah, it's great of you guys to sort of reach out to us on that forum. Um, All right. So we have Russian cabbie underscore lottery fan who says, I love the last podcast. These guys do have great chemistry. Thank you. So, I appreciate so that. Nice. Yeah. You know, we try our best. <laughs> we do. And then we have one from I Reactions, who sort of, I, I guess he runs the forums. Mm -hmm. over there. Yep. He's the, the top dog of the Sliders.TV forum. He's the top slider. He's the <laughs> slider prime. <laughs> and he says the new format is superb. Even if we have to do it twice, we put tons of effort into it. Yes, which has <laughs> happened before. <laughs> Not saying it was today. Nope. Not at all. <laughs> he uh, also liked Into the Mystics opening and ending. Uh, he says the opening part with the headstone is more striking and compelling beginning. Ending is tragic, uh, logical, and eerie. So he, he's kind of campaigning 
Yeah. The, the, into the mystic. I like the end. I mean, the ending is cool. It is very tragic that they got home and they didn't even realize they were home. So it is, it is very sad, very tragic ending. And the opening, you know, I, I, I can see where he's coming from because it is, I mean, it was kind of striking to see the, the grave and everything like that. I still, I'm not a real fan of it. I would have liked to have seen better, like you have said, to have had a real scene with, uh, what's his name now? Ryan. You know, a real scene with him there in real time. You know, maybe they could have come up with a better opening uh, with him than just uh, Quinn waking up. But, yeah, I, I understand where he's coming from. But the real question is, would you want Henry the dog in the scene as well? We would never want Henry the dog <laughs> in any scene going forward ever in any show, not ex- not including sliders, any show at all. <laughs> no more Henry the dog. Down with Henry the dog. <laughs> and lastly, we had one from Surf Dance Chris who – Says he has plans to listen into the podcast. So let us know if you do listen, Surf Dance Chris. Let us know what you think. You know, you can put it right there in that thread on the sliders.tv forum. Yeah, we always love getting new listeners. And of course, we love hearing from you guys. So we're really happy that this forum is here and that you guys are using it to, to reach out and let us know what you think. All right. So next week's episodes will be Julian of the Spirits. Finally, we've been talking about it for the last two episodes yes. of the podcast right well that's because they showed them out of order and all these yeah. old messages in time are talking about it jillian of the spirits will be followed by obsession not just a cologne anymore <laughs> <laughs> all righty that's it for this episode of the rewatch podcast you can keep up with listener interaction by liking our facebook page at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast and follow the show on twitter at rewatch Pod. You can also visit our webpage at rewatchpodcast.podomatic.com. And we have some of our favorite uh, sites linked there, such as Dimensions of Continuity. Uh, we've got our friends at Sliders Slide Side there. And, of course, like we just mentioned, the very active forum over at sliders.tv. So if you're looking to get in on some sliders discussion and there's no one in your town who's into that, head over there to sliders.tv. There's always a couple posts going on per week. So check it out. I think I might need to put up a link for that earthprime.net as well oh that's that right yes. like a, a valuable mm-hmm. resource there there's a lot of good stuff on there okay and remember you can always send us an email or you can record a voice message and send it over we'd love to hear what you think so you can send that to the rewatch podcast at gmail.com also if you've enjoyed the show please consider giving us a rate and review on itunes that really helps out all right well time to get out of here so until next time i'm fleeing the poverty of my native kingdom we got a slide. The Rewish Podcast is not associated with NBC Universal, St. Clair Entertainment, Fox, or Sci Fi Channel. The use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes, as provided in United States Code, Title 17, aka Fair Use. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Copyright 2015, The Rewatch Podcast. Slide.